Hello and welcome to PC RetroTech. In July 1980, at the Boca Raton offices of IBM in Florida, Bill Lowe called together a meeting of executives to try and drum up support for a new computing project. This would be Project Chess, secret even from other IBM employees. Initially a team of 12, including engineers Bill Sindes and Lou Egebrecht, firmed up the prototype concept already within a month by August 8th, 1980. It included 32K of ROM, 16K of RAM, upgradable to 256K, color or monochrome options, eight inch floppy drives, later changed to five and a quarter, an optional floating point unit, six slots, later changed to five, all to be sourced quickly from sources outside IBM, perhaps for the first time in the company's history. Lowe shortly departed the project and was replaced by Don Astridge, who became known as the father of the PC. They worked away and already by January 1981, they had 150 employees working on the project and finally demonstrated the new machine inside IBM. Then on August 12th, 1981, almost 40 years to the day, the IBM personal computer 5150 was unveiled to the world. It almost immediately became known as the IBM PC. You could buy a base model with 16 kilobytes of RAM, upgradable to 64K, monochrome, no floppy, no monitor, no serial port, no parallel port. But if you can afford $15.65, you know how marketing works, you can add on some extras, and pretty much everyone bought a $28.80 model with 64K of RAM and a single-sided floppy drive. The project was an immediate success. The machines were initially sold at Sears and Computerland, or of course you could buy one through an official IBM dealer. The base model was designed to work with an external cassette recorder, which you'd provide yourself. There was a port on the back to plug this into. But if you booted with nothing, no floppy, no cassette, it would eventually, after more than a minute, what seemed like an eternity, boot into IBM BASIC in ROM. Of course, this didn't allow the machine to compete with later 8-bit consoles, which also had BASIC. Uh, it was much too expensive for that, nor with the famous TI-99 4A, which was released just before the IBM PC, which also had the option to boot into BASIC. Of course, if you had a floppy drive, you'd use IBM PC-DOS 1.0. This was a re-licensed version of Microsoft DOS. The two were developed independently for a while and actually diverged as projects. The operating system of the IBM PC was not to be, as for many other machines at the time, CPM. It was some version of the Microsoft Disk Operating System. This is my IBM 5150. It's got two full height 360 kilobyte floppy drives, one of which you can see poking out the side here. You can see it has the 64 kilobyte main board upgradable to 256K, and this is fully populated, so there's a full 256K in this machine. You can see lots of ROMs, and there's the 8088 CPU which was standard for these machines, and I've upgraded mine with an 8087 math coprocessor chip. As you can see, there are five upgrade slots, the vulnerable 8-bit ISA slots, and these would fill up very quickly. Uh, obviously, if you had a floppy drive, the first thing you'd want is a floppy drive controller card, and IBM initially offered single-sided 160 kilobyte floppies, later double-sided 360 kilobytes. Of course, the machine wouldn't do much at all without a graphics card, and initially you had two options, the IBM monochrome card or the IBM CGA card, which is what this one is. CGA was four colors in graphics mode or 16 colors in text mode. Uh, IBM actually didn't have their own monitor when the machine was initially released, so you had to use someone else's CGA monitor, uh, although there was a composite output on the card as well. You'd probably want some kind of serial or parallel port uh, on, the on the machine, and so that was a slot taken up. And of course, eventually, people started producing cards for upgrading the memory on the machine. Uh, so this card, for example, will upgrade all the way to 640 kilobytes of RAM, uh, which is the maximum. It has a one megabyte 
uh, address space, including ROMs. Then there was a hard drive. Well, you were pretty much out of luck with a PC. Later on, IBM introduced the XT, uh, which had a much beefier power supply at 130 watts. But the original PC was something like half of that, and so basically you couldn't put a hard drive in it. Uh, although later on there were options like this Plus Development hard card, which would slot into an ordinary ISA slot and give you hard drive access on the IBM PC. Well, the IBM personal computer came with lots of games. That's why it was so famous, right? Uh, no. IBM was a business company. They were making mainframes and really huge computers that filled entire rooms. Uh, the personal computer was intended initially for productivity, uh, but there was actually a game that came with IBM PC-DOS. Basically, there was an advanced BASIC interpreter called BASIC-A on the disk, and this uh, was better than what was in the ROM on the machine. And so you could actually run a game called Donkey.Bass, which was included in the IBM PC DOS disk. The basic interpreter was intuitive to use as well. You could just press function keys at the top of the keyboard to load programs, for example, and you just type in the name of the program that you want to actually run. And then it'll load from disk very fast as well. And to run the game, you just press F2, and away it goes. So this is Donkey.Bus, and as you can see, it even has graphics. And the object of the game is to steer around donkeys that are coming down the highway at you. A uh, very impressive game for the era, perhaps, especially given that it was written in BASIC. Uh, definitely minutes of fun for the average IBM PC user. To be fair, games did start appearing quite quickly, even in 1981. Despite the fact that machines themselves weren't delivered until October 1981, a number of software companies were involved right from the start, and so there were games available when the PC itself was. Now, this included games from IBM themselves. Uh, they actually had a company make two discs called Arithmetic Games 1 and Arithmetic Games 2, and uh, these ran in BASIC. Now, unfortunately, when I actually try to run one of these, for example, rockets.bass, uh, it'll load just fine, but unfortunately, uh, it complains, presumably due to the version of BASIC A that I have, uh, it just says that there's an error in the code. Uh, so I'm not going to be able to show you those, but let's switch over to Microsoft who made a game called Microsoft Adventure. Microsoft Adventure is a booter, so in other words, it comes on a disk without DOS and actually just loads using it its own loading system. It was a 180K disk, and I did actually manage to make uh, one of these using, believe it or not, a Windows 98 machine with a five and a quarter inch floppy drive sitting on top. Uh, so this was produced by Softwin Associates, and you can see it's 1979, uh, but IBM took it over to sell in 1981. So, first of all, it does some crunching around on the disk to load some data in, and it's a text-based adventure, so basically you can type in where you want to go using commands like north, south, east, west, etc. Uh, if I type yes at the start here, it will give me instructions of how to use it and so on. But as you can see, it's a text-based game, very similar to Zork, which uh, some of us played when we were young. Uh, so for example, if I type north, it'll move north and give me a description of what I see. So no graphics here. On the IBM website, there's actually a set of historical exhibits about IBM itself. And under the section for the IBM PC, uh, they have this product fact sheet, and it includes a list of the software that was available for the IBM 5150 when it first came out. Uh, so they mentioned VisiCalc, which is for financial computations, uh, General Ledger Accounts Receivable and Accounts Payable by Peachtree Software, EasyWriter, some kind of word processor, and finally Microsoft Adventure. 
So these are the sorts of things that IBM expected people to be using the machine for when it first arrived. In fact, if you go to Moby Games and type in MS-DOS 1981, you get just 10 games come up, which you can see here. And without exception, these are either basic games or games that run in text mode instead of graphics mode. And it's not hard to understand why that is. Uh, when the IBM PC came out, the model with two floppy drives and a color graphics adapter would set you back about $4,500. So it wasn't just for your average family. Well, it didn't take game developers long to hit their stride, and already by 1984 there were beautiful four-color CGA games like this Alley Cat by Bill Williams. This was actually released by IBM themselves, and it's an impressive game in that the entire thing would actually fit into 64 kilobytes on disk. And the objective, uh, without getting killed by various things that come and attack you. For example, this dog here will go into a bit of a fight with you. Uh, the objective is to get into these windows where there are little side games to play and you have to avoid a broom. Uh, for example, here I get to go into a fish bowl and eat as many fish as I possibly can before I run out of air and uh, basically get points. And various other screens in this game will have uh, you know, mice or birds or other things that cats would be interested in uh, getting their hands on if they could. Uh, so yeah, a really fun game and uh, of course uh, many ways to die. Well things just kept getting better and by 1987 game developers had really refined their craft. Uh, there was this game Elite uh, which is not much bigger than Alley Cat on a disc and yet this has full 3D rotated graphics. It's really hard to appreciate just how impressive this is. Bear in mind, we're still running this on an original IBM PC. And as you can see, it's not just wireframe, but shaded 3D graphics rotating. Uh, really, really impressive for the era. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the games that I wanted to show running on this machine. But uh, there's something else that I've kept specially for last here. In order to celebrate the anniversary of the IBM PC, the 40th anniversary, which was just a couple of days ago, I've been working for months on a secret project, uh, which I've just uh, whimsically called IBM Project Chess. And in keeping with the chessboard theme, it's a 3D chessboard effect, uh, which I want to show you now. The first version of this that I want to show is this one. It's a chessboard scrolling to you from the distance at 60 frames per second. This is a simplified version of the final effect and it's similar to something I've already shown on the channel previously. Uh, but this one has a little twist. As you can see there are two blues here and one cyan. And no, I'm not changing the palette mid-screen. That still wouldn't work anyway because there are no four color CGA palettes that have two blues. Now it was possible to have a quasi graphics mode using text. Uh, basically you'd set the character height to two pixels and you'd pick a very specific character in the character set which was half in the background color and half in the foreground color. And this gave you a kind of quasi 160 by 100 graphics mode uh, which was 16 colors. And there were a handful of games that actually used this. Uh, but I'm actually not doing that here either. In fact, every second pixel here is black. Not that you'd know that because uh, the resolution here is so high. In fact, uh, the resolution across the screen is 640. In fact, there are so many pixels here that there actually isn't enough video RAM to fill the entire screen. And so I have to have a little window in the middle. That's using every single byte of video memory. So this is called an improper mode, and they were discovered relatively recently, well, the last 10 years or so, by Re Enigne, and perhaps others knew of them, but I'm not aware of anyone who discovered them before him. Uh, so these are highly convoluted modes, and I'll describe in the next video on the channel about the making of IBM Project Chess, as I've called this little demo. Uh, there's really a tour de force. Uh, gone into producing this little effect, especially to run at 60 frames per second. The CPU actually doesn't have enough power 
and the video card is too slow, the memory is too slow to be able to update all of those pixels uh, every frame and so there's a whole load of tricks that have gone into producing this. Now uh, the second version of this that I want to show you is the final version that I came up with again running at 60 frames per second but now scrolling side to side as well still within the 60 frames per second. Now you might wonder what that weird wiggle is at the bottom and the original intention of course was to have the chessboard go all the way to the bottom of the screen uh, but unfortunately there just isn't enough power in the graphics or CPU uh, to pull this off and I've tried every trick I can think of up to this point uh, to get it to work in the full resolution here but anyway I was able to do some animation at the bottom in the amount of time and so I end up with this little squiggle that's going on. Uh, so that's my IBM project chess, the secret project I've been working on for the last few months and I'm going to make a video about how I made this effect and why it's so tricky on this hardware. Uh, so look out for that on the channel. Uh, so uh, that's all I have time for this week. I hope you've enjoyed this little retrospective of the IBM personal computer, 40 years old, uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, isn't it amazing how far we've come? Anyway, thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and to subscribe to the channel if you want to see similar things in the future. And we'll see you in a later video. Bye.